Good morning. Thank you for joining. Thank you for strengthening the citizen science community around the world. Uh, although this is called the European Citizen Science Conference, it is obvious that the impact is global and this is very inspiring. Uh, there are interesting things happening throughout the conference, such as the social room and the daily menu. Uh, these are social dimensions of the conference uh, that makes it so engaging. And of course, wonderful speakers, <laughs> uh, like those in, uh, in our session today. So this session starts with uh, short talks. Uh, the speakers are Kate, Rebecca, Janice, Ilya, Lisa Lotte, and Emilio. Each speaker will give a short presentation of around five minutes. This is to allow discussions at the breakout rooms that will follow. Feel free to ask uh, questions throughout the session. We collect them and presenters will reply to them at the QA session at the end. So I hand over to Kate now. Hello, everybody. Hi there, good morning. It's great to be part of this conference today. My name's Kate Luthwaite and I'm from the Woodland Trust, a UK environmental charity, as well as my colleague, Rebecca Gosling, who's going to speak directly after me. The Woodland Trust is the UK's largest woodland conservation charity founded in 1972. And on screen is our vision. Volunteering is very much at the heart of what we do. And at the Woodland Trust, we have three long term citizen science projects. And today I'm going to talk about one of them, Nature's Calendar. Nature's Calendar asks volunteers to record the natural signs of the seasons, such as dates when butterflies emerge, flowers come out or birds start feeding their chicks. This adds to a historic data set for the UK, which began in 1736. We collect these records right through the calendar year, and they're a powerful tool for the long term monitoring of climate change as warming temperatures cause the timings of the seasons to shift. Our findings show that spring is becoming earlier and autumn becoming later. Nature's calendar is a mass participation project with thousands of people who can each theoretically add hundreds of records each year. But that brings a, a number of challenges. Here you can see our frog spawn sighting map with good UK coverage for 2020. Many of our citizen participants in these projects are dabblers who may only undertake one single citizen science action. For instance, recording their first annual sighting of a butterfly with nature's calendar. Data quality is one of the big challenges, particularly from our dabbler audience. Some may not have the best identification skills, for example. This picture on the left was recorded as a snowdrop in flower at the end of March, when it was in fact a white bluebell. You can see from the photos that the two are really very different. Our solution to this is online verification based on the time of year a species would normally be expected to be seen. If outside this date, like the bluebell, a verification process is triggered and people are also encouraged to upload photos and comments, which will be checked if the time of the sighting sounds odd. The other issue with dabblers is they may not stay long with the project. This graph shows levels of engagement with nature's calendar over an 18 month period. At each deepening level of engagement, people drop off. This is a logarithmic scale. So the drop off is actually enormous. We do try to move people along a deepening engagement journey. We're careful to feed back the value of the results for science and for our understanding of climate change. Here's our newsletter showing our two great project staff. We also encourage people who've made their first Nature's Calendar record to make more using newsletters, social media and website blogs, like you can see here written by the team. 
In years when we get mass media publicity, such as through BBC Springwatch TV program, the initial take up is huge. But you can see from this graph that after an initial engagement in 2005, very few people continue to record in future years. Note this is another log scale, so showing an enormous drop off. We believe that many people feel that adding a single record is sufficient and completes their relationship with the project, so this can be challenging. Although the TV publicity does bring wider benefits to our charity, such as new donations or engagement in other Woodland Trust projects. And as you might also expect, the number of people making a large number of records in a single year is not enormous. These people marked with the arrow on this graph are our highly valuable super users. Note this is another log scale graph. Most people enter records via our website, but a few still record via paper forms like this one. The paper recorders are generally our super users. Some of them have recorded with us for 20 years, spend many hours searching out species to record and returning almost complete forms. For instance, Valerie Hurst, who has added 672 records of different species in the past decade. She's also one of our media stars. Here she is in a promotional film. Plus, she blogs for the project website. Of course, someone that adds a single record a year, but adds it for the same species and event every year for 20 years, is also a super user. This lady, Jean Coombs, has been recording oak bud burst every year for 50 years. 50 years! If you look at the red trend line on this graph, you can see how much earlier her bud burst sightings have become, we believe, as a result of climate change. So our challenge is how to make new super users from our online participants. We know this type of intensive nature recording and annual form filling only appeals to certain groups. But those people can be very committed, especially if the project ties in with their natural interests to seek out and record nature. And we definitely need to recognise and celebrate the super users we already have. There aren't many of them and they may not realise how very special they are. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Kate. Our second speaker will be Emilio. I hand over to Emilio then. Thank you. I apologize. We have uh, five speakers. It is Rebecca Gosling. Please, Rebecca, I'm sorry. To start the presentation. Thank you, Katerina, and thank you to everyone that is watching. I'm here to present a quick case study of super users, and this is the Observatory Project. Observatory is a multi-partner project which uses citizen scientists to act as an early warning system for tree pests and diseases in the UK. We started in 2013 and we're a multi-partner project to have partners including other governmental organisations and charities such as ourselves. The project consists of volunteers who survey woodlands across the UK looking for true pests and diseases. They monitor the spread but they're also looking for new introductions, new pests and diseases that might arrive in the UK. Our volunteers are considered super users. The volunteers are recruited with existing tree ID knowledge. Some of a background in forestry or arboriculture. This requirement allows us to train experts in tree health as the basic requirements are already met. The project has a limit on the number of volunteers. This allows us the time to train and support volunteers to become experts within tree health. I'm a full-time volunteer manager and I'm supported by my colleagues in forestry research, who are the experts in tree health and a governmental organization. The partnership, the partnership nature of this project means these experts provide tree health training, centred around 22 priority pests and diseases. 
They're reported using Tree Alert, which you can see here, which is the UK tree pest and disease reporting platform, and it goes directly to governmental scientists within forest research. The platforms used by the public, but observatory contributes a measurable amount of reports. In 2019, 27% of the reports in Wales came from our volunteers. The volunteers are supported by a wealth of resources available online. These include videos and specially designed observatory ID guides. Our training is annual, um, so this means that our online resources allow volunteers to continue learning throughout the year. Um, and we also have a forum, so we have a volunteer-only forum on our website. This allows volunteers to network with the experts, talk to our lead volunteers and help each other with ID and surveying. Again, this helps with engagement throughout the year. Volunteers only meet on an annual basis and they're spread across the whole of the UK. The forum allows them to network and feel like more of the project. Some of the advantages of training these super users. So our data is of good quality and it's trusted by professionals. Individuals have been given special allowances so they don't need to take samples and their ID is trusted, saving time and money. As this graph shows, confidence in the network is growing and so is the amount of data submitted. The time we put into volunteer management allows us to develop a good relationship with our volunteers. This helps with retention, so less advertising and less recruitment. We have a waiting list for volunteers and we only recruit annually and we do often recruit industry professionals and ex-professionals into the project. So some of the challenges of super users. An obvious challenge comes with the large amount of volunteer management time and a lot of training hours. Um, as I previously said, I'm full-time and I'm a volunteer manager and have a lot of support um, from ed experts in our partnership organisations. Um, and we're really lucky because the staff we have are fully dedicated to the project, but it does take one hell of a lot of time. Another challenge, volunteer management, comes with managing expectations. And this is the largest challenge for me. Volunteers have so much expertise and so much experience that sometimes they can overstep the line of a project, for example, providing the public with tree advice um, or not requiring the correct permissions. To combat this, we ensure we provide good and honest communications and clear guidelines. Also, unlike some more traditional citizen science projects, we aren't pushing for public reports and do not have thousands of volunteers. Nationalist means we have less press and less engagement from the general public. And this impacts our aims of raising awareness of tree pests and diseases. So we combat this by visiting events around the UK to have a physical presence in forestry. We also have a wealth of resources available online. I want to talk a little bit about barrier removal. I'm a big believer in removing barriers to engagement. And I want to increase the amount of people involved in tree health in the UK. This way, I need to recruit volunteers that aren't currently experts. So we only ask for native tree ID. We don't ask for a tree health background. In addition to this, we have complete flexibility in time and type of survey. Volunteers can survey whenever they want and permissions depending wherever. We leave a lot of these decisions up to the volunteer so they can fit their role within their lifestyle. We have also have two types of survey that makes it easier for volunteers to do this. To aid with engagement, lead volunteers have also recently been added. These are for helping new volunteers and those with less experience. They're recruited by region within the UK and use the online forum to communicate with volunteers in their region. The role is quite new and it's developing all the time and there has been a mixture of engagement. Just gonna quickly show some case studies to show the power of citizen science for our subject, which is tree health. The first one I'm going to talk about is ash dieback. So ash dieback is a disease of ash trees that is fatal and it was first found in the UK in 2012. It's caused the losses of many of our ash trees. To understand this disease, the authorities want to monitor the spread. They created this map, they split the UK into 10 kilometer squares and put a colour in that square when Clara ash dieback was found. However, in Scotland and Wales, there was a lot of empty squares and no colour in. Two of our volunteers knew that this meant lack of data, not lack of Clara. So they went around, both called David, went around their respective areas and spent a lot of time recording ash dieback and added a lot of knowledge in their areas to where the Clara was. And both of them have single-handedly completed most of the squares within their areas. It's taken a lot of work and a lot of miles and they've done a really good job. And it's been really appreciated by the authorities to know exactly how this disease is moving. Similarly, um, Jim has found cases of Phytophthora remorum, um, which is a disease that normally infects larch, um, in sweet chestnut. He's found several new sites down in the southwest um, of sweet chestnut having remorum, which has helped us control this disease. 
Um, he's been, as been told to me, that he has sort of a radar from a mooring because it's normally quite hard to ID. Um, but the authorities have really appreciated this. So these case should studies show how volunteers are adding to tree health knowledge in the UK. My challenge relies, lies within continually engaging the volunteers, but at the same time, balancing that with managing their expectations of the project because they are expertise within their field. Thank you. Excellent. As we collect questions for Kate and uh, Rebecca's uh, talks, thank you very much. Do uh, put your questions in the chat. We collect them. And of course, this panel emphasizes discussions. So, so there will be breakout rooms with each of the speakers taking the role of the um, mentor or let's say a facilitator of the discussion. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I hand over now to Janice and Sign. Thank you very much, Janice. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Janice Ansign, and I'm Senior Project Manager for Citizen Science in the Faculty of STEM at the Open University in the UK. I'm going to take you through a whistle-stop tour of three of our main citizen science platforms. So to start with, um, the Open University is the UK's largest university for distance learning. We provide flexible and innovative um, distance teaching in a way which we call more we regard as being supported open learning. Over the years, we have integrated this approach into citizen science. We offer different ways of working with nature, engaging with nature and other, other science subjects in innovative ways. And this is just a snapshot of projects over just over, to, over the past 10 years, a little bit over 10 years. The main projects I'll be talking about today are the Evolution Megalab, um, iSpot, and Treezilla. Um, Evolution Megalab was started in 2009, also um, was, was as an as a, as a innovative project that was over one short time frame. So it would be just one, one innovation. iSpot is a long-term project and also Treezilla. So the Evolution Megalab project, project was pan-European. It involved over 14 countries around Europe. And the overall timeline was between 2009 and 2010. The focus was on the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth and also celebrating the 150th anniversary of the origin of species. The focus was a public survey of banded snails. Um, and this, the overall aim was to, to, to explore evolutionary responses to climate change. We created a website um, and this included historic records from between 1930 to 1980. And then the, the big engagement part in terms of using citizen sciences was to get new data posted by the public. We used a whole range of engagement tools. We had quizzes, which, which were quite useful to, um, to train users and test their abilities so that we could help them recognize correct snails and their morphs. And we also had ID guides, school activities, events, and other activities. And the key thing was we also had it translated in different languages, and this made it, made it more accessible across Europe. We also had large ranges of different activities that hit the media. So in looking at the types of users we've had with Evolution Megalab, I'm just going to look at the top the, 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 the sort of the um, the top figures that came out of this project. We wrapped it up at the end of um, in, in in 2010 and started collating the results and also doing publications. and the, And the, the the link you see here at the bottom is for one main paper that actually explored the citizen science methods that we used. So as you can see here, we we really hit you know, the, the large general type of outreach that you can get with the media. There were lots of news stories, lots of publications, and we hit over 5 million in the UK. Um, and that's just for the UK, not in recording the rest of Europe. However, the other numbers do record from the rest of Europe. So we had over 71,000 um, hits on the website. But as you can see from this, we only received just over 6,000 registered users. 
just over 2,000, just under 2,500 submitted records. And, 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 and this, then they recorded just over 6,600 records. And the range of users were public, schools, universities, scientists. But just showing that the kind of engagement, even though we had this sort of step-by-step -step approach of engagement and using and giving feedback, we still got results that um, were reasonable because they we actually were, were verified and there were real records and good records. And they actually did produce some, some um, results. Of course, we weren't able to keep this project running. We actually closed the website down a year or so ago, but there was still interest in this. I'll just now run quickly through the next project. So um, Treezilla, our monster map of trees, uh, we launched Treezilla in 2013. And the main focus of Treezilla is a platform for citizen engagement. At the same time, it's a resource for learning about trees, a tool for recording trees, uh, a, a standardized database for trees, and a platform for collaborative surveying. So we work with a number of different organizations to get their data onto Treezilla. And the key thing with Treezilla is that it calculates ecosystem service assessment of, of trees, so the value of trees. As you can see, it's just a snapshot of what we have on the site at the moment and the different areas of, of the, the different categories that it calculates. The key thing about Treezilla is that it will help anybody learn about trees in terms of how to map them. The, the key thing of what we're trying to do, we're trying to create a map of urban trees in particular, because we know that data about urban trees is lacking. And at the moment, only 1% of urban trees are in open maps. So we're trying to sort of fill this gap. What we've achieved with Treezilla so far, and just to note, we have a we just launched our new website, um, and um, and there's also a new app available. We're still working through Kinks. It is in a in in a, in alpha phase at the moment, so we're taking comments and so on. So do please have a look and let us know. So so far, we have over a million tree records. Um, the smaller scale, we have only a thousand registered users. Some this about four hundred are more active, in that they've been using the site in the past um, twelve months. Um, most of these users add two to ten trees, and the users range from different groups, public authorities, tree wardens, schools, universities, etc. And interestingly, we do get lots of downloads from public authorities and those who manage tree data sets. And so 98% of our records are from these types of sources. We use it in teaching. And so for one example is our OU students collect data as part of an assignment and they identify and research and identify research questions. And over 2018, um, almost 5,000 5, 5, 5, trees were added by um, 200 students. So it shows the type of users who are really engaged in this process and get something out and get this additional element out of it, the additional area of learning. And now to iSpot. Now, iSpot is a major platform that the OU launched in 2009. It was originally part of the Opal Explore Nature project. And the ethos behind this was really looking at the big numbers, the numbers of people who watch BBC nature programs, particularly because we have a collaboration with, with the BBC and create lots of programs on this. We want to figure out how we could help them learn. So we're taking all the, the elements of learning we've had from the experiences of Evolution Megalab um, and, and taking these on board to see what we could do to build something at a larger scale that's ongoing. The hook we believe was having, to, having, them, having them experience that thrill of exploring, and exploring nature and the hook of, of, of the sense of achievement they can get when they can identify something. Um, the, 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 the timelines I said, it's ongoing. Um, we had overarching aims that focused on lowering barriers to ID, making nature accessible, building a new generation of naturalists, and of course, contributing to biological data recording. The site has innovative tools, and we use a whole range of, of, of different engagement mechanisms. So one of the key things about iSpot is this emphasis on learning. 
and the way the site is set up, it, 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 we, we look at this experience in these five different ways, the site and the things that are attached to it in terms of engaging our users. So they yeah, can, drop, they can uh, browse by spot, they can identify, they can contribute, and they can personalize their experience and gain recognition through quizzes and assessments. And they're exactly. running out of time. Yes, thank you very much. So um, this is just a snapshot of the results from iSpot so far. Um, as you can see, the top ranging going down to the to 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 ten to to the users who have actually registered and added identifications and agreements. And of course, our super users, a lot of them come from different expert organizations and scheme societies who support users by giving comments and feedback. I will stop there and open up the floor for questions later on. Thank you. Lovely, Janice. You presented. Uh, many initiatives, and we understand very much the wealth of uh, information. Uh, we'll be having time for, for questions, and thank you for your enthusiasm. Next speaker is Emilio. It is 2 a.m. at Emilio's yes. location. So thank you, Emilio, for being so courageous. <laughs> the floor is yours yeah. five minutes. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry if I, I start rambling too much, but all right, I put in my clock. Um, so what I'm presenting here um, is an unusual case of citizen science, which is for uh, social variables. And the idea is how can we not only introduce dabblers into scientific processes, but rather into scientific thinking. Um, and we've done some works of mapping over the years, uh, personally with some colleagues um, in El Salvador and some other places around the world. and. There are some things that uh, when you do community mapping don't quite work well. Um, one of them is that mapping sometimes brings you data that's not good at all, uh, that's not real, that does not represent the, um, the actual information that you can find uh, using different methodologies. The participants are not experts and that's one of the reasons. And the other is that depending on who is uh, participating of your workshops and your activities, you'll have different results. Um, we wanted to bring this process into uh, something that would begin with mapping and end up with measurements and something that would um, create more commitment on behalf of people who were working with us. The context of this project was for communities downtown in San Salvador uh, from different age groups and the objectives were um, to do mapping of social variables related to violence in the city, but also to monitor later on uh, environmental and social variables using this uh, initial set of data. And this is one image of uh, one of the communities. You can see that there's a great variety of people that were working with us. Um, we were interested in finding out how can we use this information into more than just creating the maps, but rather to create the space for um, discussion, for um, also commitment, and all, and then to uh, to bring on new processes. Um, the first idea is that citizens go be, uh, have to go beyond being data points and not just gather information from them, and. The way that we did this was by using game uh, that we created that is very similar to a game that probably you've seen before, which is Cards Against Humanity. We have two stacks of cards. One is uh, locations, the other is scenarios, and people would draw cards, and depending on what they would find, um, they would read it out loud, and then people would vote. And we would get an initial set of data that would not necessarily be the reality of what we wanted to find if we were to do a more uh, intensive approach to gathering information, but rather it is about finding out what they think and what, what, what can we do with this initial set of information in terms of uh, immersing people into thinking about their um, locality and what are the initial assumptions that they have to think about? And that creates a baseline for scientific thinking that brings people into the concept, for example, of um, a null hypothesis. And we use this to move forward. So this is one of the um, set of data that we had. 
Um, as you can see, this is what you usually would call a, a heat map. And we would simply use this for people to start having discussions around the data. We would bring them at the end of the workshop and we would make them owners of this information. We would give them copies of this for them to think about it, to discuss, and to say, yes, we found this, but we're not too sure to create this discussion. But then from this, we would create um, an immersion into the concept of falsiability so that they would come into a more uh, organized process of creating the models and the methodologies with which they would um, falsify this initial set of data. And that, that was a, a very good process for us. And we saw that participants would be very engaged in, um, in coming from being a dabbler, a person who would only come to one, one activity, see what was happening, to work with their community. Um, in some cases, we had children bringing their grandmothers and start discussing not only about what this data is, but how to measure it, what tools can be used. And what you see here is one workshop on which um, the participants would create or would work on deciding what kinds of sensors they would use for measuring environmental data that had to do with uh, road uh, problems with traffic, uh, with uh, social uh, uh, safety and other variables. And finally, that simple data collection analysis can engage participants. So we come from a game to participation to a result that comes back to the community instead of being the usual facilitators that come to one place, gather information, and then bring it back or put it on the cloud far from some of the users of this information. And we would engage people into thinking about what to monitor and to create plans for monitoring. And this was one of the great things about this uh, process. And that is how we finish. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll have time for questions later. Perfect timing, Emilio. Thank you very much. It is so inspiring to see the citizen science community uh, globally uh, and the, the wealth of uh, practices. Uh, perfect. Uh, please do ask questions for Emilio. Uh, next speaker is Alice. Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Alice, sorry, we cannot hear you, Alice. Can you please try again? Right, yes, there's hello. sound coming in, Hi. please, Alice. You can see, okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I join you from today. This is the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I acknowledge I'm, that I'm, this... I'm, ter I'm terribly sorry to, uh, to ask you. We do not see your slides, but we hear you. This is at least... Okay. Um, Can you share your slides? I apologize. We we'll try one more time. It happens to everyone all the time. Now we lost them, but uh... here we go. I'll try again. I apologize. I'll be quick. I'm sorry. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, that I join you from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today, I'm, I have the pleasure of um, 
presenting on a topic that's really dear to my heart, which is lowering the activation barrier for chemistry and citizen science. And this is a topic that myself and my um, collaborator, Dr. Claire Murray, um, who isn't with us today, have been um, talking about for a long time as chemists who are very interested in promoting citizen science more broadly, and particularly for our own discipline. So we view chemistry um, as, as the central science. Um, this is something that has been termed widely in the literature for a long time. And, and really, it's not to place chemistry as being any more important than any other science, certainly not from my perspective anyway, but just to acknowledge that it plays a role in bridging um, the physical sciences and the biological sciences, and that lots of disciplines exist at the periphery of chemistry, where chemistry meets biology or physics, for example. We have some examples here of astronomy and um, of botany, of quantum um, computing, of medicine, and all sorts of different things. So the title of my talk is about lowering the activation barrier, and I promise this is the only kind of chemistry graph in my talk, but one of the ways that Claire and I view this is that there are some inherent barriers to creating more citizen science projects in chemistry. And we refer to this as the activation barrier because we're familiar with this in chemistry is the amount of energy that we need to change some reactants into products for a chemical reaction to happen. And we think there are many uh, barriers to chemistry in um, citizen science. We know that in early, reviews in 2015, some of the analysis of citizen science types projects showed that the vast majority of projects were biological, um, over 70%, and chemistry is really underrepresented. Some of the reasons for this could be because of the inherent challenges of using chemicals, of ordering chemicals, of ne needing special equipment, of needing um, laboratory access, um, of people not feeling um, like they have uh, the right places or the right spaces to perform chemical uh, reactions or chemical projects within the community. And this is something that both Claire and I have worked on through um, our projects. And I'm going to very briefly introduce Claire's. I hope that you'll have the, the opportunity to hear more from Dr. Murray at another, at another time. But Project M is a project that Claire um, and others launched at um, diamond light in the UK. And this is a project that's exploring calcium carbonate, um, this very important substance that makes up um, many of the carbonaceous species within the seas and the oceans. And she designed, along with others, a project where school students would be involved in making different polymorphs, different forms of calcium carbonate, according to some procedures that were sent to their schools. And each of these uh, 100 schools made 10 different samples, hence the name Project M, which overall aimed to have 1,000 samples for analysis. Um, and the students were given instructions about how to prepare these before they were sent back to the beam line and analysed. So I'm going to move on to, to the project that, that I'll even spend a little bit more time on that um, within the, the amount of time remaining. Um, and this is a project that's about making medicines with high school students and undergraduates. And when you first mention this to people, sometimes they conjures up ideas of this character. This is Walter White, who was the affable chemistry teacher in the hit um, AMC TV series, Breaking Bad. But if you are not lucky, it conjures up the person that he became, a notorious crime lord, um, Heisenberg, who was making illicit substances with an ex-high school student. That's not what we wanted to do at all. Um, so we named our project Breaking Good because we're trying to make medicines that matter. Um, and over a number of years, we've worked with undergraduates, hundreds of undergraduates and a smaller subset of high school students to recreate um, expensive medicines or to make um, drug candidates for malaria in their high school labs or in the undergraduate laboratory. Um, and one of the stories that um, was kind of a breakout success for, for the project was when we recreated the expensive medicine Daraprim. Some of you may have heard of this medicine. It was originally used for malaria, um, but was uh, is now used for the treatment of toxoplasmosis. And this medicine was price hiked by um, 750% back in 2015. And so a group of school 
students worked with us to recreate this substance very cheaply and efficiently in their efficiently in their high school labs. Um, and this made some international news because the substance was worth worth in heavy air quotes a lot of money in the US at the time. Um, we want more chemists to be involved and we want to remove some of these barriers. So we've done some surveys, a very um, uh, initial surveys just on Twitter of the chemistry community to ask um, people, chemists in the community, if they would consider um, being part of chemistry, um, citizen science projects and started to explore some of the barriers so that we can remove them, hopefully. Um, and one of the things that I've been trying to do for the last couple of years is to celebrate chemistry based citizen science projects in a column that's hosted by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my talk. I'm very, very sorry for the technical hitch at, at the uh, beginning, and I look forward to answering some more questions in the following session. Wonderful, Alice. We are so pleased to have a speaker from uh, from Australia. So I see it's dark outside. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we, we already have collected questions for you. So uh, a, a bit of you know strong coffee for you. Wait and until mm -hmm. the end. Same for Emilio uh, outside Europe. Uh, so uh, the floor is now to Lisa Lotte and Ilya. Thank you. Yes. Very much. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Lisa Lotte. I will be presenting um, the Citizen Science Project Clean Rivers, a Dutch project, together with Ilya Beudel from IVM. I myself am a researcher and together with Annelan Sandstra, uh, we're studying this project um, and especially the citizen scientists in this project. We would like to discover the motivation and the preferences of citizen scientists and um, Ilya is really involved in what if they want to do more. So the Clean Rivers project, also called Schone Rivieren in Dutch, um, started in 2017 and more than 600 trained participants monitor waste along river banks. They use the OSPAR protocol to categorize the plastics and they monitor twice a year 100 meter tracks. There are three big partners in this project, IVN, uh, Ilya. She is really involved in the education and training of the volunteers. The other two big partners are Plastic Soup Foundation and uh, Foundation of North Sea. They are involved in the protocol the analysis and the lobby. And the external partner, Leiden University, uh, we study the citizen scientists. So we did a motivation study and we uh, surveyed people before and after the monitoring. And uh, some uh, something about the backgrounds of the citizens. They're quite old, at least um, average age is 55. And also they have a, a higher education mainly, 70%. Um, and um, what we also tried to find out is why they participate, so this motivation. And we saw that um, it is mainly activistic why people participate. They want to do something about the plastic soup and they uh, are disturbed by the litter and want to improve uh, the environment. And why they actually want to study the waste, monitor the waste is uh, because they want to tackle the problem, uh, tackle the source um, and also help force uh, government or companies to take measures to prevent the waste. And we saw that there was a bit of a shift towards more activistic um, motivation uh, when we surveyed after the, the monitoring. And we can really see two types of, of motivation, um, but it's mainly activistic. So trying to tackle the source, um, collecting info, uh, force measures, more than uh, that it's just fun or nice to be outside or learn about uh, litter. And we also found that um, yeah, there were no significant differences between people having these different motivations and regarding feedback they yeah they're actually quite interested in in overall outcomes than watching their own data and also interested in yeah these action steps why what we will what will we do with this data so we're monitoring this motivation throughout the projects longitudinally and we're also studying some other aspects like we're uh, mentioning them with the name river litter researchers, yeah, using this name. And 74% sees themselves as a litter researcher, but 26 doesn't, more like data collectors. Regarding their experience with cleanups, uh, many people have some experience, 88%, but only 25% collect data during these cleanups. The people that don't collect data, 64%, they, 
they think that cleaning up is more important uh, or didn't consider this or takes too much time or don't know how. Of course, also people are more committed in their daily lives, also thanks to this project. They, um, yeah, they're doing actions in their own environment, in their own daily lives. And 41% actually wants to do more. 8% only, yeah, they don't need to do more. They think this is enough for them. The people that want to do more, they actually, 47% um, wants to minimize their personal use of plastic packaging. And 18% wants to address their network, their people in their network to stop using disposables as well. 35% yeah, wants to lobby, educate people or set up cleanups, for example. So, Ilya? Yes, then we come to my part. So I'm more engaged with the, part with the participants. And I find, as the numbers show, uh, participants always want to do more, or not all of them. Uh, so what, what do you do then? Well, my first action is to um, organize them. And um, to organize them is, is really to facilitate leadership. So if you see people who want to take up leadership and want to uh, start a local lobby action or whatever, uh, facilitate them. But also be inviting to uh, and open to new ideas and see what they need and see what they um, are um, encountering in their local communities. Uh, another way to organize is, of course, we've heard it before, offer training in skills and in knowledge and give access to knowledge. Um, on our website, you can find many uh, things that uh, volunteers can download, can watch to, um, to, to make more impact in their local communities. Uh, another way to um, uh, to work together is organize events together. And if you organize events together, you you are more in touch with the um, with the needs of the of the of the users of the dabblers. And this is one of the pro products we we uh, uh, made together. And it's a uh, the the researchers said, well, we know a lot about the litter, but we don't know so much about the um, nature. And, and this flyer sort of um, makes it in um, makes it uh, visible, uh, the both sides of it. Now the other um, uh, the training we do is in storytelling, so creating ambassadors and uh, trying to uh, helping them to tell a strong story about clean rivers, and also trying um, a, a lobby training in which they learn how the local government works and how you can uh, approach them best. Um, and we share knowledge by, for example, webinars about the results of the project of Clean Rivers, about European legislation, which is coming up, and also in um, a local lobby with your local government. Um, so there are many things you can do, but it's um, not easy to work with volunteers if your colleagues are not, are not used to it, because volunteers have their own um, uh, agendas, they're, uh, they're very different, um, so train your colleagues in working with them. And if there's resistance in your team, please address it. And if you don't address it, then um, it's, it will be gone. And always, always appreciate your citizen scientists in all your communications. Um, I think that's it. I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> uh, so all the questions you have, um, please put them in the um, in the chat so they will come back to us wonderful and i see also uh, tips that could be applied in other projects so thank you for uh, for being attentive to participants concerns and doubts thank you very much Lisa Lotte, Ilya. let me thank please uh, give the floor to kate kate will be uh, give you the guidelines for the breakout rooms because you have many questions. We have collected some something like 40 questions so far. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the speakers for not only delivering information but engaging the, the audience in, in talks. So, okay, to you, and then the, the link to the Zoom will be shared. Thank you. 
Yes, and I echo Katerina's thanks. That's some really, really interesting talks. Thank you. So as Katerina said, the rest of this workshop is now moving to Zoom so we can have some proper interactive discussions. Uh, we were down to have two 15-minute sessions um, and then a plenary um, all on Zoom. I'll leave it to the discretion of our controllers to work out how to divide up the time. So all you need to do as a participant is follow the Zoom link. You'll automatically get put into two um, um, short discussion sessions, each facilitated by a speaker. Uh, speakers, reminder to you, please take notes and be prepared to report back in the plenary session. Um, so it just remains to me to say thanks to everyone and please have a look at the Vimeo chat, follow the link and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers. Hey, hey, hey.